here today with Steve Medema, who is a professor of economics at the University of Colorado, Denver. Um, and uh, he's not just a professor of economics, he's also one of our uh, INET grantees in the inaugural round um, for a fascinating project, a book project, um, titled Legal Fiction, An Intellectual History of the Coase Theorem. Um, and I just find that title, I just have to ask you, uh, where do I start? Legal fiction? Well, what's that all about? Well, the Coase Theorem is one of the more fascinating ideas in the history of post-war economics. And what's particularly interesting about it is that it's attracted an enormous amount of attention, literally thousands of academic articles dealing with it, in spite of the fact that it deals exclusively with a world that doesn't exist. That's the fiction part. That's the fiction part. Okay. It's theoretically nice, tight, and actually quite amazing and wonderful in a lot of ways, but it has absolutely no real world applicability whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But what's the legal part? The legal part is that the theorem deals with the assignment of legal rights, and it tells us that no matter what judges do in a frictionless world, there would be no impact whatsoever on the allocation of resources in society. So in, in essence, it says law doesn't matter, institutions don't matter in a frictionless world. And the idea happened to captivate the minds of all sorts of people, particularly at the University of Chicago, but also a lot of other places, and in fact became part of the basis, especially the ethical basis for the whole economic analysis of law. Now, when you say Coase theorem, this is a mathematical theorem? It's not mathematical at all. In fact, it's strictly intuitive. It's never been proven. That said, it's absolutely right, but it's, it, it's nothing more than an intuitive idea that in fact is not even amenable to, amenable to mathematical proof. So here's a it sounds like an idea, okay, that was created by this fellow, uh, what was his name, Ronald Coase? Ronald Coase, who won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1991. For this theorem? In part for that, and, and also for other things as well. Um, one of the interesting aspects of this whole history is that the theorem was little more than a throwaway idea for Coase himself. He used it to show that in the frictionless world economists deal with, uh, law doesn't matter. Uh, and in fact, markets can solve problems completely efficiently. Uh, and Coase's message is, let's go on looking at the real world where markets are costly, government is costly, and try and figure out what's the best way to solve problems. Now, you, uh, you have written a book about Ronald Coase. Yes, an intellectual biography of Coase in 94 that looked at the, the range of his contributions to economic analysis. And so he was a pretty interesting fellow? He's an incredibly interesting fellow. Yeah. Uh, in all sorts of ways. You had very eclectic interests, a very vast record of publication, but it's united by this theme of looking at real-world economic institutions and seeing how they operate. Unfortunately, the fascination of economists with the Coase theorem has led them to a, a fairly distorted view of what Coase was really all about. And his legacy is much more with the new institutional economics and the economics of property rights than with the law and economics movement of, of Richard Posner and others. Okay, so this law and economics movement you mentioned. So this is a group, an intellectual movement, that picked up on this little piece of Coase. The law and economics movement has had what sort of effect in the world? It's had effects inside and outside economics. I mean, it's generally regarded as one of the first successful examples of what some people like to call economics imperialism. Now, what's happened in reality is a lot more complex than that, if you look at the intellectual history. But the fact is that the use of economic tools in law by economists and also by lawyers has had a transforming effect on law as well as on economics. You see uh, in, on the bench at the U.S. Supreme Court level with people like Antonin Scalia, uh, at the federal court level, uh, a great influence of economics in judicial decision making as a result of this law and economics movement. Now, so how do you write a book like this? What, what are your sources or what do you, how do you, what are you going to be looking at? Well, this is a project that has a fairly broad database. I mean, the most obvious uh, starting point is, is the, the scholarly text literature. As I mentioned before, there's been more than uh, 4,000 articles in the legal and economics literature that have cited the Coase theorem in some way. But that just tells you sort of the history of the theory, as it were. Um, with a lot of interviews, the, uh, a lot of archival work, we're able to get at some of how the theorem was created, how scholarly communities were built around these ideas, and so on. Um, one of the things that fascinates me about this project is uh, the ability to look at how the idea diffused in the textbook literature. Uh, if you actually look at how the Coase theorem made its way into the textbook literature, you see some utterly amazing things that are illustrative of the problems that arise when economists are grappling with new ideas, trying to figure out how to transmit those ideas to students. Uh, and so you see things that are completely nonsensical and that, and that are flat out wrong in the textbook literature. Uh, 
illustrative of the tensions in dealing with new and controversial, in this case, ideas. You say history of economics. So you're a historian of economics. Yes. Um, and all your work has been history of economics? The vast majority of my work. I've done work in public finance and in law and economics as well, including theoretical work on the coast there. And have you been, and this, this law and economics sort of nexus has been an interest from the beginning? Or yeah, well, as a graduate from? student. Yeah, I did my PhD at Michigan State, worked with Warren Samuels, got exposed to law and economics there, a much more eclectic brand of law and economics than you see in the mainstream professional journals today, uh, one that looks at uh, the interrelationship between the two in that sort of modern Chicago way, but also draws on the institutionalist tradition of people like John R. Commons, Robert Lee Hale, uh, in, in looking at the, the totality of how law and economics can intersect, rather than the more modern version, which simply takes economics and exports it into legal reasoning. Mm -hmm. So did you write your dissertation in the history of economics? I wrote part of my dissertation in the history of economics. I was on the front edge of the multi-essay dissertation movement, uh -huh. and one, one was straightforward computational general equilibrium and uh, tax policy analysis, and the other was, was some law and economics. So you have a job in an ordinary economics department yes. um, at uh, the University of Colorado. So how do you manage to maintain your research interest in uh, the history of economics, and what do you teach, and how does that all work? Uh, I, I teach a course regularly in the history of economics. I don't teach as much as I used to because I direct our university's honors program now. Uh, but we require the history of economic thought of all of our undergraduate majors. Until a few years ago, it was also required of all of our master's students, and I still get a number of master's students in the course. Uh, but for example, this semester I'm teaching 75 students in my history of economic thought course. On the research side, uh, it, it's all about maintaining balance. I'm fortunate enough to work in a very mainstream department, mostly applied micro theory. Um, our department is sort of a department of free economics in a lot of sense. But my colleagues are very happy to have me do what I do. Uh, what we care about in our department is do good work and publish it in good places. And if you do that, we like you. And it doesn't matter if it's history of economic thought or economic history or applied econometrics. But it's pretty unusual that a department would require history of economic thought, is it not? It's incredibly unusual. Well, what's the story there? There must be some reason. Uh, it has to do with who was in the department a long time ago. I mean, we're, we're a relatively new university. Um, mid-1970s was sort of when the, when the Denver campus became solidified, and the people who were there early on had a strong interest in the history of economic thought, so it got written not just into the curriculum, but into the degree requirements, and we have maintained a continuity of having someone in the department who teaches the subject, and uh, because of that, it has not been pulled out of the major requirements. Uh, I, I expect that perhaps when I retire that will change, but that's a while away yet. Uh, now, you've also done a lot of service to the uh, group of historians of economics. You've been editor of the journal. Tell us about, that's, that's part of your professional development as well. Yeah, I, I became editor of the Journal of the History of Economic Thought in uh, mid-1998. I was in my mid-30s at the time, and that's somewhat an odd career move at, at that point in your life, but I decided I wanted to broaden myself, that I could keep you know, researching in the niches that I research in, and uh, remain unexposed in a deep, deep sort of way to a lot of other things that I ought to read but wouldn't make the time to, uh, or I could respond to the suggestion that uh, I take over the editorship of the journal and read broadly. And, and one of the great things about being a journal editor is being forced to read all kinds of stuff that you wouldn't otherwise read. And I've become a much better teacher uh, and a much better scholar for having edited the journal. Um, but how are, how, so this, this breadth, this is the kind of book it sounds like you really need 30 years of background in order to be able to, to write. And so this feeds in all of this, this, this experience. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things about the history of economic thought is that you definitely get better at it as you get older. You know, with a broader range of experiences, exposure to a broader range of, in this case, historical methodologies, whether it's the history of science uh, or intellectual history or whatever the case may be, are, are going to come together to make you a, a better historian. And the, having thought about things for a long time, having done a bunch of things that ex have exposed me to a much broader set of issues over the last 15 years than I had in my head when I wrote my book on Coase, is going to make a history like this one actually a much better and deeper and richer history than, than say, my book on Coase was. Well, we really look forward to seeing what you come up with. Um, it sounds like a fascinating project. And meanwhile, we welcome you to the stable of the INET economists. Thank you.